So hello friends. So today I'll give a brief overview on this urine anion gap. Uh, so it's a concept which uh, one should have a little bit of a clarity. So I was asking my trainees recently. So and uh, many of them feigned a bit of an ignorance on this. So it's good that we have some clarity. It's a little murky topic. Um, and there are certain sort of a nuances with this topic. And even this uh, is being questioned as whether this is a right tool to be utilized now because of a lot of limitations. So we just try to understand as to what has been the conceptual understanding of urine anion gap until now. Uh, so, so the main thing, since the name is urine anion gap, we need to look at components in the urine. So there are, I'm sure many of you have listened to my earlier video on the low anion gap and anion gap. So there are cations in the urine. So I'm sure everyone who is listening knows the cations that are commonly measured are sodium, potassium. And there are unmeasured cations. So this is important. In urine anion gap, for all the trainees, remember one unmeasured cation that tends to act as a compensation for acidosis that is setting in is ammonium. Okay? So remember ammonium and that becomes the integral component in the urine anion gap. So this is unmeasured cation, which is ammonium. Calcium, magnesium are also unmeasured cations in the urine, which contribute. So these are the cations. And the unmeasured cations are these, as I said, and anions. Anions, I'm sure all of you know. So sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate is serum anion gap. But in urine, we don't take bicarbonate. It is sodium plus potassium minus chloride. That is urine anion gap. So anions, measured anions are chloride bicarbonate. There are unmeasured anions, which are sulfates, phosphates, and organic anions. So this is what you need to remember. So there has to be, to maintain electrical neutrality, there has to be a balance between these cations and anions. So our understanding is, if there is increase in certain anions, that needs to be balanced, balanced by cations, be it measured, be it unmeasured. If that balance is not there, then acidosis sets in. So this is our conceptual understanding. So the unmeasured anions, remember, is sulfates, phosphates, and organic anions. So urine anion gap, as I said, the serum anion gap is sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. In urine anion gap, we only take sodium and potassium minus chloride. We don't take bicarbonate. And like in serum anion gap, urine anion gap can also be called as unmeasured anions minus unmeasured cations. So the normal urine anion gap, so this is again controversial. If you look into Google and see the urine anion gap, they say it can be zero can be 20, but normally there will be positive urine anion gap up to 70, you can consider it as normal, maybe equivalence per liter, that is normal, up to 70. If it goes more than that, then there are there is a lack of balance between the unmeasured cations and unmeasured anions or measured cations. So urine anion gap can also be said as urinary, urinary, urinary unmeasured anions minus urinary unmeasured cations. Like in serum, we minus anions minus cations. Even in urine anion gap, there are unmeasured urinary anion minus urinary unmeasured cations. So this is the understanding of the urine anion gap. So what is its utility? Why are we now wanting to understand about urine anion gap? Its main utility of urine anion gap is when you have a patient with hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, which tends to happen in DKA, which tends to happen in patients who are being aggressively volume resuscitated, you have a situation where you have hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Here you need to understand where is acidosis setting in, whether it is bicarb losses from the gut or whether it's a problem with the kidney. So the acronym to be remembered is if it is negative, N-E-G-U-T-I-V-E, -E, so gut is there, then it is the gut losses. If there is urinary losses, so if there is urinary loss of bicarbonate or if there is urine is unable to compensate, urine anion gap is positive. It means it will, positivity can be more than 70 milliequivalents. We consider it as abnormal. It becomes positive. So more than 70 milliequivalents, you have to think kidney is unable to compensate for to cause electrical net neutrality. So that neutrality is not maintained because kidney is unable to compensate because of various disturbances. And the commonest cause of urine anion gap being positive in the setting of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis is renal tubular acidosis. It can be type 1, 
typical type 1 renal tubular or distal renal tubular acidosis are the causes. So it is renal tubular acidosis which where kidney is unable to maintain the net neutrality. That is your understanding. If urine anion gap, so what is the compensatory mechanism? So when there, when there is a uh, problem, the compensation of the kidney is to increase the urinary ammonium. So as I said, ammonium is the unmeasured cation. So the unmeasured cation should compensate by increasing. So urine is unable to increase ammonium. If this is, that's why your urine anion gap will be positive. But if urine anion gap is negative, as you see the acromine DUT comes negative, then it means it's the GI losses. Because when there is GI losses, so when it's a negative, it should be minus 20 to minus 50 milli equivalents. We call it as urine anion gap being negative. Then the problem is with the gut losses of bicarbonate. Because when there is a gut losses of bicarbonate, kidney is normal. Kidney compensates by increasing the ammonium excretion in the urine. And the ammonium is the unmeasured cation. So the kidney is compensating when there is a gut loss. But when the problem appears in the kidney, then kidney is unable to compensate by increasing the ammonium. And that is where it becomes positive. We call it as a kidney problem. So increase in the ammonium is increase in the unmeasured urinary cation. And that is when your urine anion gap becomes negative. Simplistically for all the trainees, if urine anion gap is negative, then it is a gut loss. If urine anion gap is positive, means normally in healthy individuals, it is positive. If it is more than 70, then there is some problem in the kidney because kidney is unable to do the compensation because of the RTA problem, renal tubular, which I'll very briefly talk about. Either it is type 1 or type 4 renal tubular astrosis. And for all the trainees, urine anion gap, you cannot interpret in the setting of two conditions. If the patient has AKI or CKD, because the whole acidosis is being contributed by sulfates and phosphates. That's why this cannot be reliable. So in AK and CKD, the acidosis is predominantly contributed by sulfates. And I ask all the trainees, why is acidosis happening? It is due to sulfates and phosphates in AK and CKD, which contributes to the acidosis. It is not due to the unmeasured anions or unmeasured cations. So this is something we need to bear in mind. So now we have understood that, that that's all it is about urine anion gap, but there are a lot of criticisms or limitations of late about the whole concept of urine anion gap. So what are the critics? The argument is in healthy kidneys, the ammonium that kidney compensate not necessarily correlates with the urine anion gap is the argument. And the pH of the urine in healthy kidneys is around 4 to 7. And the argument is pH of 4 to 7 is not maintained by ammonium, but it is predominantly maintained by bicarbonate and phosphates, which is the measured anion and unmeasured anions or what are contributing to this pH 4 to 7 is what is the argument. Because now the pundits are arguing that ammonium not necessarily is always the cause in healthy kidney to maintain anion gap. And they have seen historically that the urine anion gap has been progressively increasing in the healthy kidneys now. Before it used to be 40 milli equivalents. And before they used to say when 20 milli equivalents is normal. Now progressively there has been increase in the urine anion gap. In healthy kidneys, urine anion gap, they are noticing it is more than 70 milli equivalents. And this is due to increased potassium content in the diet people are consuming. And because of the food additives that people are consuming, the organic anions are contributing to the unmeasured anion which is leading to this sort of a pH and increase in the urine anion gap. So this is the critique of late that no longer we can say that urine anion gap is 20 to 40, even it is now exceeding. And ketoacidosis, unmeasured anions are contributed by keto acids, which is beta hydroxybutyric acid and acetoacetic acid, which are again unmeasured. So in ketoacidosis, it becomes unreliable as well. And in someone who is doing glue sniffing, like toluene inhalation, there is hippurate, which is also an unmeasured. And in proximal renal tubular acidosis, when someone is on treatment with bicarbonate, so this becomes a limitation in sort of interpreting the urine anion gap. And D-lactic acidosis also is a limitation in interpreting uh, the urine anion gap. And chronic acetaminophen use, where there is pyroglutamic acid accumulation, the interpretation of urine anion gap can be problem. So these are all the limitations. That's why interpreting urine anion gap as, as simplistically as saying 
the compensation depends on the ammonium rise by the kidney and if that is not happening it leads to urine anion gap is little superfluous because a lot of other sort of variables which are which act in tandem to determine urine anion gap and solely uh, pinpointing it to ammonium uh, may become little superfluous is our critique at this point of time so you keep it at that if you read more and read, more and more sort of variables are there which influence urine and an gap and saying it's only the ammonium compensation. Like if there is gut losses, kidney compensates by increasing unmeasured cation with ammonium uh, that, that leads to uh, negative urine and an gap is little superfluous because of so many other variables that are contributing. If you remember that, that's a good enough for all our intensive care trainees. So briefly, in hyperchloremic acidosis, type 4 renal tubular acidosis is something that is common cause of uh, high urine anion gap. And type 4 renal tubular acidosis typically happens in hypoaldosteronism. So if you recall why this happens, because aldosterone, the main function of aldosterone is for sodium retention and potassium excretion. So here, because there is aldosterone deficiency, there is no secretion of aldosterone there is no sodium reabsorption. So sodium is not being retained. And because sodium remains in the tubules, so the water is secreted into the tubules and there is chloride reabsorption from the tubules. And there is no potassium secretion into the tubules and there's no hydrogen secretion in the tubules. And there is more excretion of sodium and water because there is no sodium retention. This is the commonest cause for positive urine anion gap. And in type 4 renal tubular acidosis, as compared to type 1, both can cause RT, uh, urine anion gap positive. Here, there is hyperkalemia because your aldosterone is deficient and sodium is not retained, potassium is increased. So, they have hyperchloremic acidosis and hyperkalemia. And just to recapitulate, the causes of type 4 RTA is hypoaldosteronism, which can be genetic or by Gordon syndrome or diabetic nephropathy, or any glomerulonephritis or obstructive uropathy, which we commonly see in ICU. Or someone who is on AC inhibitor, ARBs, or calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporine, NSIDs, all these are causes of type 4 renal tubular, which can lead to urine anion gap positive, UAG positive. Or you have aldosterone antagonists like trimethoprim, I mean, uh, and potassium sparing uh, diuretic. And you may have sodium channel abnormality where there's inhibition of the sodium channels or voltage gated deficiency of the channels. All these are some of the causes. But the, these are common conditions that nephropathy we see commonly in ICU. And we do get ICU patients with uh, obstructive uropathy. So all these are some of the causes of type 4 renal tubular acidosis. So just a flow chart, how we approach a case of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis uh, in interpreting urine anion gap, if you have a patient with hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, check urine anion gap. If it is negative, then there is a gut loss of bicarbonate. So you have to give fluid resuscitation. If it is positive, then you need to do urine pH. You need to do serum potassium mainly to delineate whether it is type 1 or type 4. If urine potassium is high, it is type 4 renal tubular acidosis. And look at all those causes, hypoaldosteronism or AC inhibitors, ARB, trimethoprim and potassium sparing diuretic, voltage gated channels, obstructive uropathy, look at those causes. So if urine pH is less than 5.3, potassium is low or normal, it is proximal RTA. If urine pH is more than 5.3, serum potassium is low or normal, and fractional excretion of bicarbonate is less than 5%, and you have classic type 1 renal, uh, renal tubular acidosis. And if urine pH is less than 5.3, and serum potassium is high or normal, and fractional excretion of bicarb is less than 5%, then it is type 4 renal. So, this is a simple algorithm which you can remember and apply in your practice uh, to try and interpret your urine anion gap. So, this is our understanding. So, summarily, for all our trainees, if there is increase in the chloride, in urinary chloride, this is a measured anion. If there is increase, there, it has to be balanced by the kidneys. The compensatory mechanism is increase in the ammonium which is an unmeasured cation. This is our assumption that when there is increased chloride, kidney should compensate by increase in the unmeasured anion, which is ammonium. That's why you get positive or negative. And this compensation will tend to lower the unit ion gap and keep it with a net neutrality or electrical neutrality. But if there is an imbalance, if there is increase in the unmeasured anion, unmeasured urinary anions, Unmeasured urinary anions are sulfates, it can be phosphates or it can be organic anions. If there is increase, 
and there is no compensation by the kidney by increasing the unmeasured cations, which is ammonium, which has to happen, or increasing the sodium or potassium. That is when uh, your lowering of urine anion gap does not happen and it becomes positive. So positive urine anion gap means the problem is in the kidney, which is not able to increase the ammonium. So if it is lower, then kidney is able to increase ammonium, then the, it means kidney is normal. So the problem lies with the gut. So this is our conceptual understanding. Hope it is clear. So rehear to this lecture because if you read more and more, there are more other caveats, but I try to simplify and uh, have points which are only pertinent to our practical application. So request everyone to submit your valuable work to a journal of acute care. You can visit my website, uh, www.drpadipanagopa to rehear to this lecture. So thank you. Thank you, Vinod.